All right. Good morning. Thumbs up. You can hear me. Okay. All right. So um, I just emailed everybody a file that I'm showing here on screen. Um, it's just it's just something I had I'd thrown together so we could kind of review what we've done so far in terms of series and power series. So let's just go through this real quick. We have a lot to do today. I uh, hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, first of all, uh, series. So remember when we were talking about series, it's just the sum of a sequence. And here's the notation we use now. Notice that I started my index here at zero, but when we were first learning series, we did our index starting at one. But then when we went to power series, we switched it to zero. And, and I told you that's really just a dummy, a dummy index. It can start anywhere we want it to start. Um, so that's the way I'm presenting this now. Um, remember, it was just, it was just uh, when this was first in, introduced, we, we were adding up just numbers, right? Everything was just a number plus a number plus a number plus a number. And then we'd have to figure out whether or not that converged or diverged. We were, we were investigating geometric and telescopic series as the only series that we can actually find the sum of. So if they can, if you have a geometric or telescopic series that converges, we can actually find the number it converges to. Otherwise, we just have a bunch of tests that we use to determine just the convergence or divergence. We won't be able to see whether or not it adds up to a number, or I should say, we are not gonna find the, the actual sum, we'll just know it does add up to something or it diverges. Then we started talking about power series last time. So what happened here with power series is that we have, we have a series, but now we've included this additional X variable in the, in the um, sum. And so the general form, we went over this last class, that's the general, general form of a power series. And that is called a power series about A or centered at A. So this number here next to the X, is where we are centered. If you don't have an A next to the X, then you can imagine that that's an X minus zero, and that means we would have a power series about zero or centered at zero. Any questions on that notation or anything or terminology? Okay, so then we started to talk about, well, a power series can be looked at as a function. And the convergence or divergence of that series will depend exactly on what happens, what's going on with X. So if X is a value for which the power series converges, then we can define the power series as a function. And that would be a well-defined function as long as the X we plug in gives us an output that, that is convergent. So we would say that the domain of this function F is the set of all X values for which the series converges. Any X value that you would plug in here that would make it diverge would not be in the domain of the function. So from that, we had a theorem. This was very important from the end of last time. It says that if you're given any power series, then there are only three possibilities when it comes to the convergence of that power series. It's only gonna converge at a single point when X is A. So if I replace this X right here with A, then that's A minus A, that's zero, zero to any power is zero. So you're just gonna be adding up zero infinitely many times, zero plus zero forever is zero, and that converges to zero. So you can have that happen, or you can have it converge for any value of X. That means no matter what X you ever plug in, it converges. Um, or you can have it converge on an interval, on a single interval. And if it converges on an interval, then there exists some capital R so that, such that if the distance between X and A is less than R, then we have convergence. And that capital R is called the radius of convergence. And then you can determine from that using the property of absolute values. And we discussed this last time, how you solve this, in, solve this inequality, drop the absolute value bars. I'll go through an example today. Um, once you do all the algebra on this, you can determine the interval of convergence. And there are four possibilities when it comes to an interval. You can have a closed interval where both endpoints are included. You can have an open interval where you do not include the endpoints. Or you could have left endpoint included, right endpoint not. Or left endpoint not included, right endpoint included. 
So there's only four types of intervals that we can have, and that is called the interval of convergence. So generally speaking, if you're asked, if you're given a power series and you're asked to determine capital R, the radius of convergence, all you have to do is set up this inequality and then whatever this number is, well, you're done, that's your R. But if you're asked for the interval of convergence, you actually have to find the interval and then you have to test the endpoints. Now, I gave you three examples on Wednesday. We went through and I gave you an example of each one of these scenarios. So I'll just remind you that last time, these are the three examples that we did. I won't go through the work, but we did the ratio test on each one of these. You can look in your notes. And we determined on the first example, we had a radius of convergence of infinity. And that means the interval of convergence was everything, right? So no matter what, it converged. And what I have here for you now is um, the opportunity to look at that power series. So here's that power series. Um, or that, yeah, that power series. I'm, I'm gonna just start showing you what this converges to. So there's not a lot you can see from this other than the fact that when you take this sum and start adding up all these powers of X, that you're starting to get a function, okay? And the more powers of X you go, okay, the more that this, fun this function um, becomes complete. So in the beginning, this is just adding up the first few terms, but the more terms we add, the more you start building the function out. And what this, what the radius of convergence being infinity means is that as I keep adding more terms, this function is gonna keep going out left and right. And we can, we can trust that that picture is a good picture. Now that's hard to understand until you see the next example. Let me show you the next example which is this one that, oh yeah, this is the order we did it. This power series, we said, yeah, it does converge, but it has a radius of convergence of one fifth and the interval is negative one fifth to one fifth. And you don't include the left endpoint, you do include the right endpoint. So let me show you what that power series looks like. Let me get this one in here and this one out of here and where the hell is it? There it is. So, and let me back this up. Okay. so. Um, I didn't put one fifth in here. Let me, let me get one fifth in here. Hold on. X less than negative one fifth. X greater than one fifth. So this was, this was our interval of convergence. This was our interval of convergence, which means that if we look in between negative one fifth to one fifth, so ignore the blue and the, in the pink, that this function only exists in this little region. And so as I start to add more terms to the power series, you can see it starts to converge. And, and what's happening here is everything to the right of this one fifth, every, we don't even look at that part. It's just the function in between here and here. Does that make sense? We, the inter, this, this power series is only valid when we're in here. Anything on this over here, we just ignore it. Anything over here, we ignore it because we have divergence. Any questions? Okay, let me get this out of here. The last one we had was this one. And we determined with this one that um, when we did the limit and everything in the ratio test, it blew up. And the only way to control it from going to infinity was to let X be zero. So this was a, an example where it only converts at a single point so the radius of convergence is zero and the interval of convergence isn't really an interval, it's a single point, X is zero. So if I plug X zero in here, I get um, the only valid point. So this is an extremely useless kind of series, uh, but I'll show it to you, here it is. So what, what this is saying is that we're only allowed to look in this tiny little, only at a single point and that's the only place that it's valid no matter how far I go out with this, I have to ignore everything over here and everything over here. It's only, this function only exists at that single point. Quite, quite a boring function, not something that we would very find very useful, but it illustrates the three different scenarios. Are there any questions on that? You sure? There'll be a lot of information coming at you today. Okay, we're moving on. 
All right, so the next thing I want to talk about, where is it? Is, oh, kind of giving it away here. So I have, I have a uh, power series here. And this is actually a, a, a famous, famous power series. Uh, this is called a Bessel function of order, I believe this is order zero. Let me just double check that. So Bessel function order zero, yeah. So there's, Bessel functions are used a lot in physics, in engineering. Um, they're used to model, um, they're used to model things that are vibrating. Like if you take a drum, right? If you take a drum, it has some membrane up here that you hit with the stick, right? You hit that and the membrane vibrates. The shape of the vibration on the drum can be modeled with a Bessel function. So, so they're, they're useful, but that, that's not important to us. What's important to us is to show that this is a function. This is a well-defined function. And we're interested to know what its radius of convergence is and what its interval of convergence is. So that's why I said find R, find IC, interval of convergence. So what we're doing is we're saying, look, we're, we're looking at this as a function and we're asking ourselves, what's the domain? That's basically what we're saying. What's the domain of that function? So what we need to do is run the ratio test. Oh, and you know what? I didn't, I didn't point that out here. Very last note here, we use the ratio test to determine the convergence or divergence of a power series. So we're always gonna be using the ratio test. All right, that's why I told, when I told you about ratio tests, I told you how important it was. It's because that's pretty much all we're gonna use. Okay, so I'm gonna run the ratio test on this. And to save time, um, just remember the ratio test, I'm gonna have to plug N plus one into all of these, right? And then divide by just that and then flip it. So I've already done that work. Let me, let me move this up here so you can see it. Okay, so we replaced all of these with N plus ones. So be careful when you replace this, uh, when you replace that and that and that and that with N plus one, you gotta be careful because that two is gonna distribute here and here. And then this N factorial becomes N plus one factorial. And then I divide by this which is same as multiplication of the reciprocal. And then what I did is I just got rid of the, I got rid of the negative one parts because the absolute value is gonna make those go away. Um, and then when I, did, when I did this one, I did X, that becomes X to two N plus two. And then I split it into two, two factors, X to the two N times X squared. And then when I did this one, this becomes two to the two n plus two. I split that into two, two to the two n times two to the two. And then n plus one right here, factorial, I use the property of factorial to rewrite that as n plus one times n factorial. And you know what, I'll at the end of class, I'll send you all my notes here that I have. I'll send all of these to you in a PDF so you can, you can have them so you don't have to worry too much about copying everything down. Um, so I use the property of factorials to split that up. I still have squared here, and then nothing really changed here. Last thing I did is I put the squared on each one of these. So I squared the n plus one, and I squared the n factorial. And then at this point, a bunch of stuff cancels. So you've got this, 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 uh, this n factorial squared cancels. And all you're left with is an x squared on top. So I put that here. And on the bottom, you have two squared, and then you have this n plus one squared right here. And so I've noticed I've separated, I've got the stuff with n's here, separated from the stuff with x's. And now we take the limit. And if you let n go to infinity, this goes to zero. And if this goes to zero, then it doesn't matter what x is, right? No matter what x is, this is gonna go to zero, and that will always be less than one, which means that it doesn't matter what I pick for x, which means x can come x can come from any number, right? In between negative infinity and infinity. And so the interval of convergence is everything and the radius of convergence is infinite. That means if I have, if I actually start drawing out this function, I'm gonna use Desmos to do that. We can trust that the function matches in both directions forever. Now, 
it depends on how far we go with the series. So let me let me show you this series. Um, get rid of this one. Let's get rid of that. Where's that vessel function? Here it is. Let me draw this back. Okay, so here's the vessel function. Let me zoom it out here. So this is just the beginning. It's just the first few terms. As I start adding up more and more the terms, I get something that looks like this. And I'm gonna zoom out. So right now we have some crazy stuff happening at the edges, but that's because I'm I've only gone out to the first 25 terms. The more terms I go out, the better it gets. Can you all see that so far, like in here, this kind of looks like, it's almost like a sine function that's that's been kind of dampened. Okay, so this is why we use this for, for things like vibrating membranes. You have you have a higher amplitude in the middle and then you have it, the, the amplitude starts to diminish towards the edges. So again, I just want you to see how you determine the radius of convergence and interval convergence of a power series. You run the ratio test, and then that's gonna give you the one of those three cases, right? Are there any questions? Okay, so that is going to do it for 8.5. You know, the homework in 8.5 is almost completely, <clears throat> well, most of the problems that matter which are problems three through 21, all say find the radius of convergence and interval of convergence. So that's, make sure you do those problems because that guaranteed is gonna be on the final. You're gonna to have to be able to, to do this, all right? And, you know, it's easy. I think the problems are easy when this limit turns out to be something like when this goes to zero, this is easy because your, your radius of convergence is infinite. And it's easy also when this goes to infinity because then the only place that map, the only way you can control it is if you let X be zero. The harder case is where you have an interval. And that's because you have to always check the endpoints. So I would refer you back to last class, this example that we did where we had to check the endpoints. I am most definitely, absolutely 100% going to give you a problem on the final where you'll have to check endpoints because when you check the endpoints, you have to actually do two tests, two different tests using the stuff that we learned from eight, four. Okay. All right, we proceed. So now what we're gonna do is move on to eight, six. All right, so eight, six. It's called representing a function as a power series. And really, this is probably the most important thing to us. What, what we've been doing before is I've been giving you a power series, right? And I've been saying, hey, look, this power series we can find its domain and then treat it like a function. So I give you a power series and say, hey, look, that's a function. Now what we wanna do is start with a function and turn it into its power series. That's a much more difficult thing to do, but it's, it's more applicable. That's the thing that, that's the ultimate goal of all of this. So in 8.6, we are going to stick to one and, and only one type of function that we can convert to its power series. So we're very limited in this section. We are going to use this. So just, I want you to keep in the back of your mind that right now what I'm giving you is not something that allows you to take any function and convert it to a power series. It's only one particular one. Now in 8.7, we will learn how to take any function and convert it to its power series. But for, for this one, we're just gonna start with, with baby steps here. So let's say we take the function f of x, equals one over one minus X. Now I realize that that's a very strange function to start with, but you'll see why this function is where we're gonna begin our work with this. And I will graph it for you. Uh, let, me, let me open up. Yeah. Okay, so just so you see the graph, here it is. Here's, here's the graph of one over one minus X. You can see we have a vertical asymptote at one, right? 
So here's the graph. The question is, can we come up with a power series that would draw this graph, right? Can we come up with a power series? And I'm gonna kind of um, spoil it here. I'm gonna show you the power series. And let me back it up a little bit. Here's the power series. You can see this red line right now is not a very good approximation of this black curve. But as I go more terms into the power series, do you see it trying to wrap itself around that function? Now, do you see that we're not doing a very good job over here? And we're not doing a very good job over here. It looks like maybe this is only valid if we're looking maybe in that little window. If we look in this little window here, then we are, we've got some power series that looks like it's matching up with that function. Do you all agree? Okay, so let's, let's build to that. We're not, we're not there. I'm kind of, like I said, I'm, I'm spoiling it by showing it to you ahead of time. So here's how we're gonna do this. We're going, to re we're going to remember from geometric series. Do you remember from a geometric series that geometric series look like this? A plus AR plus AR squared plus AR cubed plus dot, dot, dot. And we could re re rewrite that as sum n equals zero to infinity A times R to the N. Now this notation that I'm using here I showed that to you last class that instead of using a one down here, we can change it to a zero as long as we change that n from an n minus one to an n. And I told you to write that on your formula sheets. So what I'd like for you to do here is um, I'd like for you to replace a with one, and I'd like for you to replace r with x. So what would this look like? If we replace a with one and r with x, we get one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus dot, 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 forever, right? Sum n equals zero to infinity. If I replace the a with one and the r with x, I get x to the n. Y'all agree with this? Yes, sir. My question is when would this converge? Because geometric series don't always converge. When would, when, this one converges only when? The one in blue only converges when, when what? Converges when what? When the absolute value of R is less than one. Yep, when the absolute value of R is less than one, right? That's the only time we have convergence here. And so this series should only converge when the absolute value of X is less than one, right? This is gonna converge when the absolute value of X is less than one, because that's really, that's our R in here, right? So here's what we're saying, is that, well, let me, let me ask you this question before I, before I get to this over here. What would, what would the blue converge to? Let's say that this blue converged, what does it converge to? If it converged, so if the absolute value of R is less than one, didn't we have a formula for it? What was the formula? A over? A minus R. One minus R, right? Wasn't that what it was? So let's say that this one converges. Let's say that the absolute value of X is less than one. Then what would this converge to? Well, A is one, right? So one over? Zero. One minus, I'm using this formula, but I replace A with one and R with X, right? So one over one minus X, right? That's what it would converge to. It Now, the, there's a big if here. The absolute value of X has to be less than one for this to be true. So that's, this is what we have from this, is that this function F of X equals one over one minus X, should be equal to the sum n equals zero to infinity of x to the n if the absolute value of x is less than one. In other words, this function, if you look at its graph, it should match the graph of this power series so long as your, let me write this a different way, so long as the x is between one and negative one, right? That's how we redo, that's how we do these absolute values. And again, to be clear, this just means one plus X 
plus x squared plus x cubed plus forever. Are there any questions? No. So if I go back and I look at this graph, okay, let me go back and look at this graph. Right now, right now what we're seeing here, uh, you know what, let me change this to zero. Let's see if that works. Okay, I have to write on my screen. So right now, oh shit, what the hell is that? I think you might have hit inspect element. Yeah, I know, but my shortcut, I upgraded, I updated um, my pen writing software that writes on my screen and my shortcuts are now <laughs> bringing up shortcuts from other programs. I need to go and fix it. But uh, let me do this. Let me go back to the pointer. Let me close this out. Let me just select it instead. Okay, so um, right now, okay, remember this, the one in red, right now is just the one, okay? It's just one, all right? That's all it is. Do y'all see the constant one function? So now I'm gonna increase that and now it's gonna be, now what we're looking at is, that is a pain in the ass, is one plus X, okay? So that's, that's this line, got it? And now I go, I go again, let me increase it again. And now I should have, one plus x squared, that's this. Do y'all get the idea? And as I drag this across, I'm getting more and more. So I'm gonna just stop writing that. Let me see if clearing the screen does it. Okay, so now I'm gonna just drag more and watch what happens. Boom, 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 boom. And if I'm looking just between negative one and one, okay, you can see that the red one, go back here, the red one is, is is wrapping itself onto the black one. See that? Now, you might be asking yourself, or you might be saying to yourself, well, what the hell is that? What's the use of that? If I'm interested in what's happening over here, right? Well, remember how we said these power series are centered at, right? Centered at, right now, this power series is centered at zero. Because you can see that it goes to the left one unit and to the right one unit. If I'm interested about in what's happening over here, what I would do is I would shift my power series and center it somewhere else. And then it would give me, uh, it would map itself to the function over here. Does that make sense? We're gonna see that a little bit more in a minute, but um, don't, be, don't be discouraged. Or don't be uh, trying to sell this stuff short by saying, well, you know, it's only working in that little interval. So it's not that good. It's not, you know, what's the use? It's useful, we can move it anywhere we want. Okay, now, <clears throat> let's try, uh, sorry, that had my next example on it, what I wanted. Okay, so let's do that one, x cubed over x plus two. So now what we wanna do is take the function um, f of x equals x cubed over x plus two. And I want us to find the power series for it. Find R also, okay? We wanna find R, I want the, the radius of convergence of this. So would y'all like to look at it first? Would y'all like to look at the graph of this first or do you wanna just try and find the power series? I think, um. I think power series would be, let's just do the power series, okay? Yeah. So look, here's, here's the thing though. I, I can't stress this enough. This is, that's the only thing we know right now, okay? The only thing we know is that if we ever see one over one minus X, this can be rewritten as this, so long as the absolute value of X is less than one, right? So this is like a, a new truth that we have and that's all we have, all right? So now using that, watch what I do here. This is, gonna, this is gonna be weird, all right? Check this out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this as x cubed times one over two plus x. So what I've done here is I've just peeled the x cubed out front because that's just algebra, right? And then on the bottom, I rewrote this as one over two plus x, right? 
what we have is this, right? Maybe I should just grab this. Let me grab that. Let me slap this down here. I'll make it a little smaller so it'll all fit. So I know that if I ever see one over one minus X, I can rewrite that using this sum. This does not look like one over one minus X, right? But again, more algebra, watch. X cubed times one over, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna factor a two out of the bottom. Okay, so I'm gonna take a two out of both of these. I take the two out of this one, I get a one. But if I take a two out of the X, well, there was no two, so I have to put a one half X. Do you all agree that that's the same thing? Yeah. Now I'm gonna rewrite that. I'm gonna just kind of change the order. This is one half X cubed times one over. Now just, I have a plus here, but the formula has a minus. So I'm gonna write minus in parentheses, negative one half X like that. Okay, we good? Now squint your eyes. Well, maybe I'll write it this way. Another way you could look at this is just, if you ever see one over one minus U, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be X, but it could be anything else. This should be the sum N equals zero to infinity of U to the N. So long as the absolute value of U is less than one. So we're looking at this X as like a dummy variable now. It can be anything. And so for us, do you see that we have the U here for us would be this negative one half X? We have one over one minus U. So here's, here's the next step. So what I'm gonna do is say that that is equal to <clears throat> one half X cubed times sum n equals zero to infinity of negative one half x to the n. Now that's only true when, when would this be true? That I can replace this, I can only replace this with that sum if what? X is less than true. one. If what? If, if x is less than one the absolute value of not X, the absolute value of U, U, which for us is negative one half X is less than one. Do y'all see that? This part in blue is our U and we need to make sure that that thing, the absolute value of it stays less than one. So this is the same as saying absolute value of one half X less than one. I'll drop the absolute value. I'll put negative one here, less than one half X, less than one. I'll multiply both sides by two and I get that. We did this last class, right? I got rid of the negative because it's an absolute value. I don't care. Um, and then to get rid of the absolute value, I drop it, I rewrite it, and then I put greater than the opposite of this number. Multiply everything by two, yes? So this is, this is only valid, right? We're, only, we're saying that this in, this in yellow is only valid if you're plugging in numbers between negative two and two, okay? They're on, it's only valid then. I'm gonna keep going because we're not done. We don't technically have a power series yet. A power series looks like this. Sum C sub n, X minus A to the N, n equals zero to infinity. We have that here, but we have all this other crap out here, don't we? So the great thing here is this. This is all, this right here is just a bunch of things being added together, isn't it? And this is multiplication. So we could look at this as, as this will distribute through to each of those pieces. So that means I can move it inside that sum like this, watch. Sum n equals zero to infinity one half X cubed times, I'm gonna rewrite this, one half, negative one half to the N times X to the N. So what I did here is I, I took the negative one half X and I split it into two factors and put the N power on both of them. Do y'all see that? 
I'm going to do another step. I'm going to go sum n equals zero to infinity. Um, how about we put the x's together? What's x cubed times x to the n? x to the three plus n? Yeah. So I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to write it at the, at the back. x to the, I'm going to do n plus three. Three plus n is the same thing, but I'm going to put x to the n plus three. That's this, right, together. And then on this one, I'm going to save myself some time. On this one, I want you all to look at that as being negative one times a half to the n. Negative one times a half to the n. Do you all agree with that? Negative one half is the same as negative one times a half to the n? Yes, sir. And then I'm gonna put the n on each one. So that actually becomes negative one to the n and then half to the n. Okay, so what does that allow me to do? Why, why do you think I did that? Can I do something with that one half and that one half to the n? Can I multiply those two together? Add their exponents? What would that give me in front of this? One half to the? N plus one. N plus one, okay. And then what's in front of that is the negative one to the n. Now this, this is a this is a power series, right? It's pretty pretty close to being a power series. It's all in one piece, right? We have we have something that looks like this. The only thing that makes it not technically a power series yet is that this needs to be an n up here. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, and this is this is kind of this always causes student problems. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to force this n plus three to become an n, all right? So here's, think about this. If I replace this n right here, if I replace that n with n minus three, do you agree that n minus three plus three would give me just n? Yes? So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna replace that n with n minus three, but whatever I do here, I have to do everywhere. So I'm gonna replace every n I see with n minus three. Let me write that down and let's see what it becomes. Sum, okay, this n right there has to become n minus three equals zero to infinity. And then I have negative one, not to the n, but to the n minus three, right? And then I have one half, not to the n plus one, but to the n minus three plus one. And then I have x to the n minus three plus three. Now let's just clean this up. We're almost there. This in, this in yellow, n minus three equals zero. Just add three to both sides. So this is an equation, right? Just add three to both sides. So now my index starts at three, stops at infinity. Now this negative one to the n minus three, I'm gonna write it as negative one to the n plus one. Now, why did I do this? I didn't have to do this, but do y'all understand? Do you remember when we were learning about negative one raised to powers that it didn't matter? Should I go back that far in my notes? I don't know. Let's see, I bet you I can find it pretty quick. There it is. Ah, there, wow, I found that pretty fast. So we said that if you ever wanted to, if you ever had um, negative one to, to the n plus an odd number, that these all create the same sequence of numbers. It's positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. It didn't matter as long as it was n plus an odd number. And so that's what I'm using here. I'm saying, okay, this is, this is n plus an odd number. It's the, the odd number is negative three. So it's n plus negative three. So all I'm doing is I'm just replacing it with another odd number. I could have done n plus one. I could have done n minus one. I could have done n plus three. I'm just doing n plus one because it's the more common. It's the more common one we see. Didn't have to do it, but the book I'm sure would do that in a solution. Okay, if you're looking at solution in the back of the book. Okay, next one is, uh, watch this, x to the n. I did this right here. And then this right here, what does this become? One half to what power? One half to the 
n minus two, right? Do y'all agree? Okay, now, do y'all agree that that's the same as one to the n minus two over two to the n minus two? In other words, you can do the power on the top and the bottom separately? And isn't one to any power itself? So isn't this just this? So I'm just gonna put all of this over two to the n minus two. Now, if, if you didn't do that step on a test and you would have instead right there just written like one half to the n minus two, I, that would be fine. That would be fine, I wouldn't take off for it. I'm just trying to show you like when you're trying to get yours to look like the book's answer, they're just doing some additional algebra. That's usually what it is. Okay, let's look at it all. All right, so here, here is the, here's the original function, okay? We said that our radius of, oh, we didn't write the radius of convergence, did we? But what is it here? Isn't it two? Look at this, it's two in each direction, right? So this picture that we have should only be valid between negative two and two. And here comes the power series, you ready for it? Here's the answer we just got. Uh, shit, that doesn't look right. Oh, I didn't change it. Okay, that's, that's all right. Should be it. That's it, like this. Do you see that that didn't match? And then it's better, 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 getting better and better the further I go? Yes? Okay. Uh, this doesn't match, and n plus one, what's, oh, no? Negative one to the n, n is starting at three. Oh, you know what? I started at zero, yeah. Um, yeah, I left it in the other form. Is that the other form? Yeah, it was this one, right? Yeah. So in the way I put it in the computer, I didn't I didn't change the index. I didn't put that back to an N. I left it this way. That's why I typed it into the computer. See, I left my index starting at, at uh, zero. So this, this process of changing this power right here, <clears throat> this is called <clears throat> basically shifting the index. You're just changing the index from zero to three. It doesn't change the series. Let's do one more thing with this. Let's actually write out the first few terms. Okay, let's write out the first few terms here. Let's start with n being three. If n is three, what do we get? We have to do this fast. Three plus one is four, negative one to the fourth. That's a positive number. X to the third over two to the three minus two, which would be two. So that's that. The next term would be negative, wouldn't it? Because when we plug in four here, we should get five up there. That should give us a negative. Now it should be x to the fourth over uh, two squared, that's four. And then the next one should be positive, And then it should be x to the fifth over eight minus, any questions? x to the sixth over 16. Are there any questions about this? I had a question about changing of indexes. Yeah. Um, for the exam, would we ever be asked to change the index for our problem? No, but you know what? You're most likely not gonna run. I don't think you're gonna run into it. Um, let's, I'm gonna say that caution, with caution right now because I'm not quite sure how far we're gonna get. There are problems where you do have to change the index because you're, you wind up trying to put two power series together. And whenever you put them together, you have to have the same index. So um, stay tuned, stay tuned. I don't know how far we're gonna get. We only have today and next class. So um, maybe. All right, so this is it. I mean, this, what we're saying, remember, okay, don't lose sight of this. We're saying that this here in green, right? Dot, dot, dot forever is equal to x cubed over two plus x, so long as the absolute value of x is less than two, right? That these, this expression and this expression are identical. 
So if you plug a number in here, so long as the number is between uh, negative two and two, you will get the same answer as if you plug that number into this. Now, if I go to um, Wolfram and I just type into Wolfram x cubed over two plus x, it's going to do a bunch of stuff because Wolfram just it just it doesn't know what you want. So it it gives you the input, it gives you the graph, blah blah blah, and then let's see. Look at this. See that? That's the series expansion at zero. This is the power series. This is what we just got. We just got this, didn't we? You know what we got? Okay. So the, the whole idea here is that now, and I'm really getting ahead of myself now, but if we had, to, let's say we had to integrate from zero to one, x cubed over two plus x dx. Let's say we had to do that integral. All right. That that might that's probably going to be a tough integral to do. In fact, um, I think if we ask Wolfram Alpha to integrate this, let's see what it does. It'll get an answer. Okay. Yeah. So it, I mean, there's probably some. Oh wait. Oh. Okay. So I don't know. It's we could maybe get it, okay? But it's gonna be, take a while to get it. So instead what we could do is we could say that this integral is approximately equal to, well, we don't even have to say approximately, we could say it's equal to the integral from zero to one of just replace this with its power series. I'm gonna write that as one half x cubed minus one fourth x to the fourth plus one eighth x to the fifth minus 1 16th x to the sixth plus dot, 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 dx. Do you see now we're just using the power series for this here? And I put dot, 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 that's okay. Now just take the antiderivative and we just do it term by term by term by term. So the antiderivative of this would be 1 8th x to the fourth, right? Because I'm just using the power rule on this. Antiderivative x to the third is one fourth x to the fourth, and then I hit it with the one half. The next one would be, let's see, one fifth x to the fifth. I hit that, it'll be negative one twentieth x to the fifth. And then if I plug in the next one, six here, I get one uh, plus one over eight times six is 48 x to the sixth. Do you get the idea? Yes. And now I could keep doing this, right? Now I'd, I'd, I'd want to stop somewhere. I'd want to stop because I have to actually compute this. So maybe I just use the first, maybe I just use those first three and I evaluate it at zero and one. So I plug one in here, I plug zero in here and I get a decimal answer, right? I'll get, I'll get an approximation. Now, if you would like for me to get a closer approximation, I just have to go further out in the power series. And if you want more approximate, a better approximation, I just go further out, right? And in the real world, that's all that matters, right? We don't necessarily need exact answers in the real world because we can only manufacture things within a certain precision, precision anyway, right? So I think I mentioned this in the very beginning of class. If we're making ball bearings for an aircraft, we have to have very, very tight tolerances on that manufacturing process. And so we might have to go out, you know, maybe 10 of these, 12 of these. And there, there are formulas to determine the error error that you would get and, it, and there are formulas tell you how far to go. I'm not gonna get into that because we don't have time. But if we're making those for an aircraft, we, we, we're gonna need quite a few terms in the power series to do it. If we're making ball bearings for, for a tricycle, right? A, a $20 tricycle that you're gonna buy at Walmart, right? The, the precision on that ball bearing doesn't need to be that great, right? So you, you only need a few terms. So it's not bad that we don't have an exact answer, that we have an approximate. It's not bad that we can't go to infinity, okay? We can, we can live with that. Okay, all right, where are we at? Um, so that was this one. Okay, we have another one to do, here we go.
So the function here is one over one minus X. Okay, if it were just that, we would be happy because we already know the power series for that. But what I'm gonna take, what I'm gonna do there is I'm gonna take and square it. So I want us to find the power series. and capital R. All right, so let me just say this. In the previous problem, what we were able to do was pull the X cubed out front and just leave it till the end. And then we were able to rewrite this by factoring out a two and looking at the pluses and minus minus. And we were able to rewrite it in that form one over one minus U, one over one minus U, right? Like this. Uh, erased it, I think. Oh, here we go. One over one minus u. The problem we have here is that we have the squared here. So you might be thinking this, and don't write this down, okay? You might be thinking, okay, that's just this, which it is. That is, that is what it is, right? And yes, you could rewrite that with its power series times this one, Okay, these can be rewritten. The problem is this is not a power series. It's the product of two power series. So you need an answer that's just a single power series. So how do you multiply two infinite sums? And that's actually gonna come at the end of the next section. Okay, so we're not, we're not gonna even attempt this at this point. So we have to realize something we have to realize something if we're going to do this, all right? Um, I'm trying to think of the order in which I want to do this. So let's, let's pause here for a second. Here, if you like, I'll do an actual pause button for you. There we go. We're going to pause. We're going to, we're going to come back to this because right now we can't handle this. Um, we need to talk about differentiation and integration, all right? So differentiation and integration of power series. All right, I'm gonna write a lot of stuff down right now it's going to look crazy, but the end result is going to be nice, right? So let's say we're given we're given a function that is written in a, as a power series. So this is a general power ser series centered at a. Okay, let's say we're given some function. There it is. Well, if we start writing out, you know, start plugging it in as zero, one, two, three, we'll get this. We'll get c sub zero plus c sub one times x minus a, plus c sub two, x minus a squared, plus c sub three, x minus a cubed. Again, that's just me replacing the ends with zero, one, two, three, you know, that's what we'd have, right? So let's take the derivative of this, all right? Let's take the derivative. What would the derivative of this function be? So I'd like for you to take the derivative over here. Look at this over here. And remember, we're differentiating with respect to x. So what would the derivative of this be? What would the derivative of that right there be? C sub zero is a what? Oh, it's just zero? Because it's a constant? Yeah, C sub zero is just a constant, right? It's just a number. So when we take its derivative, it should just be zero, right? I'll put that here, even though we don't need it. Okay, plus, okay, now the derivative of this, the derivative of this. Is that just x, <coughs> x? Well, the derivative, the derivative, okay, so c sub one is a constant, right? So when we take derivative of that, it's just gonna come for the ride, times, now what's the derivative of what's in here with respect to x? Would it be one minus zero? 
one minus zero, right? Derivative of x is one, derivative of a is zero, so that's just one, right? Derivative of x is one. Okay, so c sub one times one. Okay, plus, now the next one, c sub two is just a constant. I'm gonna leave a little space in front of it, you'll see why. c sub two is gonna come for the ride. Now we have, don't we have to deal with chain rule here? Doesn't this two have to come out front? So let's bring that two out front, that two is gonna go in front of the c sub two. And then we have to write x minus a to the first power, right? And then take the derivative of what's inside. What's the derivative of what's inside here? One. One, okay, so we don't have anything else, right? Plus, what's gonna happen on the next one? C sub three is gonna stay, right? What's gonna come out this time? Three. Three, then the C sub three, and then x minus a to what power? Second. Second power. And then times one, but we don't need to write it. Any guess as to what the next one would be, even though it's not written here? Four C sub three x minus a to cubed. Four, four C sub four. Oh, that's right. Sorry, my bad. Minus a to the third plus dot, 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 right? Do you all see that? That's right. Yes. Okay, now I would like to see if we can't rewrite this in sigma notation, sum. All right. So do y'all see here that we have, we definitely have a pattern, right? Definitely have a pattern. See if this makes sense. If I let n start at one and go to infinity, then isn't this just, C sub n, notice that, that each one, of, I'm ignoring the zero, that each one of the Cs, it's gonna be um, C sub one, C sub two, C sub three, C sub four. So it's just counting one, two, three, four. And the number in front is just that same number as the index. So actually I should probably put an n times C sub n, right? There's a, there's a one in front of this one, there's a two in front of that one, a three in front of that one, a four in front. And that matches with the subscripts. So do y'all see why I put n c sub n? And then look at all these things next to next to these. I've got x minus a to the first power. I've got x minus a to the second, x minus a to the third. Wait a minute, do I have an x minus a here? I don't, do I? Or do, yeah, I do. I can look at it as x minus a to what power? Zero. To the zero power. And so do you see the powers there? On the first one, it's zero. On the second one, it's one. On the third one, it's two. On the fourth one, it's three. So I would just put here what? X minus A to what power? The N minus one power. N minus one. And that would do it, wouldn't it? That would do it. If you, if you just start cranking this out, it's gonna spit this out, right? All right, so here's, here's the awesome thing though. Okay, here's the beautiful thing. Go back to the original power series right here. Do y'all see that the answer here to the derivative, do y'all see that all we did was pop that n out front and subtracted one from the n? See how the n came out front and we subtracted one? Isn't that the power rule? I mean, that's the power rule, right? Now there's one little catch though. There's one catch, our index changed it changed. It starts at one now, right? Starts at one. So that's the general, that's the, the big thing you need to take away from this. If you take the derivative with respect to X of a power series, a general power series, if you take its derivative, you're going to get a new power series that starts at one and is equal to n times c sub n x minus a to the n minus one. And that's something we need to know. So differentiating the power series, just pop the n out, subtract one, and then change the index. Well, that's, that's the way um, differentiation works. You think integration works the same way? Let's try it.
I want us to go back up to this. I'm going to grab this real quick. If this is our original power series, then what would this be? Well, you just take the antiderivative, right, of all of these things with respect to x. So do you all agree that since I'm taking the antiderivative, at the end of this, I'm going to have a plus c, right, no matter what? But it's an infinite series. So instead of putting the plus c at the end, I'm actually going to put the plus c at the beginning. I have some constant. I don't know what it is. Plus, now let me start taking the antiderivatives. What's the antiderivative of c sub 0? c What's sub 0 x? Or would it be x c sub 0? Yeah, I'll do c sub 0 x. Good. And then what would the next one be? Plus, OK. What's the antiderivative of this one right here? So just the way we, I mean, this is basically what I'm asking you to do. What if I asked you to do this? This might be a little bit easier for you to see. If I were asking you to do the antiderivative of a constant in front of x minus a number, you wouldn't care about the constant, right? And then you would look at this as almost like a little, u, you could do u sub here. You could do these one by one, couldn't you? Like each one. But do you all agree that that would also be the same as 1 half x minus 1 to the 2? If you don't believe it, just take the derivative of this. 2 comes out, kills off the half, and then you just have this thing to the first power, which is the original problem. So I'm just going to do the power rule on that linear expression. So when I do this one here, right, when I do this one, I'm going to have a 1 half that comes out the c sub one is going to be out there, and then x minus a to the second power. Same thing on the next one. One third c sub two, x minus a to the third power. One fourth c sub four, uh, c sub three, sorry, x minus a to the fourth plus dot dot dot. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Each one of these power, like basically power rule on each of those. Now let's see if you believe this. This is equal to sum n equals zero to infinity. Now notice I'm starting at zero, not at one. Uh, let me see. Hmm. So what is it? Do you all agree we're going to have a C sub n here? Do you all agree? I'm going to leave a little more space in front of that. C sub n. Do you all agree that that's there? I have C sub 0, C sub 1, C sub 2, C sub 3. Do you all agree with that? OK, what about the, what about the number in front of that, the fraction? It's 1 over what? So what are the numbers here? It's 1 over 2. It's 1 over 3. It's 1 over 4. This one here is 1 over 1. So what's, what's the fraction I have here? 1 over what? N. That's, well, we're starting at 0, though. So oh, it can't be uh, n, plus one. n plus 1, right? So if you plug in n equals 0, you get 1. That's that one. If you plug in n equals 1, you get 2. If you plug in n equals 2, you get 3. And isn't that also the power that we see? Like this denominator is the power. 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 So we should also have next to this x minus a to the n plus 1. Does that work? Does that work? Look, look, let me ask you this. If n is 1, does, does it give us something? If n is 1, let's say n is 1, wouldn't this be 1 half c sub 1 x minus a to the 2? If n was 1, that would give us this one, right? What if n was 2? Wouldn't it give us this one? 
And if n was three, it would give us this one. Are y'all following me or no? But what about if n is zero? What if n is zero? Just tell me what this would become. If n was zero, what would it become? One over one, so it's one times c sub zero, right? X minus a to the what? One. One. Okay, wait a minute though. This is just c sub zero x minus c sub zero a. In other words, I just distribute that through. Do we have that here? We don't, do we? We don't. But okay, do we have this? Do we have c sub zero x? Yes, right? And can somebody tell me what this is right here in blue? It's just a what? It's a constant. It's a constant. Isn't that what that plus C is anyway? So this doesn't matter that it doesn't match exactly because when we do N equals zero, we are going to get this expression plus a constant, but we already know we're off by a constant anyway. So this is valid. I guess what I could say is this. If I came back up here, and I just got rid of that and replaced it with C sub zero, X minus A to the zero power, right? Then this is all still valid because adding that constant doesn't matter. It's, we're off by a constant. I hope that makes sense. The end of the story is that we're in business. And what we should know is this, that if you wanna do the integral of a power series, a general power series with respect to X, that the answer is going to be a power series starting at zero, not at one. And then it's gonna be one over N plus one times C sub N X minus A to the N plus one. And again, I'll ask you to, I'll ask you to just think, this is just the power rule for antiderivatives, isn't it? This is the power rule. We yeah. learned this when we are learning antiderivative x to the n is one over n plus one, x to the n plus a constant. I should put plus c out here, sorry. So it's this power rule basically, but the power, the power we're looking at is that power right there. It's almost like this is like x to the n. And so we have one over n plus one and then all of that to the n plus one. Box that up. Okay, so we have ways now of, we have a way of taking the derivative and taking the antiderivative of power series. Back to the problem that we started with. All right, so this is gonna take some really crazy kind of thought to, to get this one to work. Do you agree with this? Hmm. What is the derivative with respect to X? What is the derivative with respect to X of, of one over one minus X? Now, the reason I'm choosing one over one minus X is because that I know the power series of, right? This is not the original function. But this, this, I, this actually is something I can write a power series for. So what is the derivative of this? Let's just, uh, let's write that down. What's the derivative with respect to x? Another way of writing that would be one minus x to the negative one, isn't it? That's another way we could have written that. Now take the derivative, just use your, use your rules from Cal one. The derivative, the negative one comes out one minus X to the negative two times negative one. Does everyone see where all that came from? Negative one came out, rewrite all this, subtract one, take derivative of the inside, which is negative one. What is that equal to? One over one minus X squared. Yep, that's one over one minus X, that quantity squared. Isn't that the original function? Isn't that what we were looking at? So I actually just had to realize that. I had to realize that that is the derivative of, of something. I had to realize that that's the derivative of this, right? Agreed? So therefore, one over 
one minus x, that quantity squared equals the derivative with respect to x of one over one minus x, but that's the same as the derivative of this power series. So long as the absolute value of x is less than one. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, instead of, instead of actually taking the derivative of this algebraically, I'm replacing this with its power series because that's what it is. So long as the absolute value of x is less than one. And now how do we differentiate this? Power rule. Yeah, it's a sum. Where does it start? We're differentiating. So where does it start? One. Okay. To infinity of now the power rule. N comes down times X to the N minus one. There it is. See if you follow that logic, all this logic again. We started with the function. We need to find its power series. We said, well, that's not, that's not the one we know, right? But it's close to, oh, wait, hold on. That happens to be the derivative of, of that thing we do know. And since this thing is the derivative of that, I can replace that with its power series, then differentiate it, and that's what I get. So what we're saying is that that is equal to that. So now let me go take a look at this. Get this one out of here. Um, here's the original function. That is one over one minus X, that quantity squared, there it is. I know that this is only gonna be valid. My answer is only gonna be valid in this window, okay? And here's the power series. There it is, it's this red one, it sucks right now, but I need to add more terms. Boom, 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 there it is. Marching away, trying to become the function. Would R also equal one? Yeah, I didn't say it, but right here, when we, when we did this, when we, re, when we replaced this right there, that step, I had to specify X, the absolute value of X is less than one. So that would mean that R is one here. Okay, I'm moving along. Next one we're gonna do, oh, same instructions. Here's the function, but it's gonna be natural log of, what do I wanna do, one plus X? Yeah, let's do one plus X. Find power series, I find the power series, I'm gonna, and R. All right, the, again, this section, the only thing we know how to control or handle is this, right? This is the only thing we know. Okay, that's the only thing we have to work with. So do you, have, do you know any way that we're gonna be able to connect this to that? How could natural law be related to this? Uh, the antiderivative? Yeah, it's probably gonna have to do something with the antiderivative, right? So let's just let's just see. What would the what would the antiderivative or we have two ways of going about this? What would the antiderivative of that be? Okay, let's just see what the antiderivative of this would be. Um, so maybe, maybe we do this. We pull the negative out. Well, I mean shit. Y'all are Cal 2 students, y'all come this far. I'm hoping everyone in here, I'm really hoping, yeah, I'll write it anyway. I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna pull the negative one out and then rewrite it like this. Okay, so I pulled the negative one out, which made that positive, made that negative. And now you have a constant over linear, right? Integral, we're not doing series right now. Don't tell me that's harmonic. Okay, we're gonna do an integral here. And the antiderivative of that, we get negative, and then antiderivative of that should just be natural log absolute value of x minus one, right? Plus constant. Do you all agree? Okay, 
but that's not what we have up there, right? That's not what we have, but there is a connection there. We do get a natural log somehow, don't we? Like if we take the antiderivative of this, we do get a natural log, yeah? So let's try something a little different. That was just kind of thinking. Let's take the original function and let's take its derivative. What would the derivative of this be algebraically? Wouldn't that just be one over one plus x? Isn't that it? One over one plus x. Wait a minute, this is almost this, right? This is almost this. This is almost this. Well, it is, it's uh, one over one minus negative x. Do you all agree? Now, can't I rewrite that as a series? I can rewrite this as a series because this looks like one over one minus u, right? The u here is negative x. So this should be negative x to the n. And this is only good if the absolute value of negative x is less than one, which is the same as saying this. Are you all with me or not? Yes, We're not done, right? We started with the original function. And what we said is, hey, the derivative of that function is this, which is this, which is this, so long as the absolute value of x is less than one. So we actually want to go backwards. Did you all see that? We want to take this, because this is f prime of x. We want to go back to f. So what are we going to have to do? Integrate it, right? We have to integrate that. But before I can integrate it, I need to do something with it. Watch. Just do it this first time and you'll, you'll see why. Okay, so that negative x, I'm gonna write as negative one times x to the n power, I'm gonna split, I'm gonna do the n on both of these. Now, the reason I did that is because all power series have to be written c sub n times x minus a to the positive n. So, we don't. We want this to be x, not negative x, in here, which is why I need to peel that negative one off front. So here is here is our power series for the derivative. Now we integrate it. So f of x, the original function should be the integral of that power series that we just found. which is equal to, let's see, what is that equal to? Um, power rule, right? We have a new series, starts at zero, ends at infinity. The negative one to the n is the c sub n. That doesn't change, it's not affected at all. In front, I put one over n plus one, and then I do x to the n plus one. I really do hope that you see that in yellow here is the C sub n. So it's not impacted by the integration. The only thing that's impacted is the power on the X and the constant out front. There it is. Questions? All right, let's take a look at it. Okay, here's the natural log of one plus x, right there. And here's our power series, here's our window, and then here comes our, oh, what the hell is that? Why do I have a, why do I have a circle there? Oh, I know why. There we go. So I, it, it, it's taking that as a polar equation. So here's zero, 20, step one. Okay, here we go. There it goes, starting to wrap itself there. Okay. All right.
me see if there's anything else here that I want to do with this. All right, that's that's it. Um, I would say that the most important problems in the homework for that section are problems three through 10, three through nine. And I say that because we are, we are sacrificing going through some of the harder problems to be able to get through more material. So focus most of your attention on problems three through nine in that homework set. Um, Just make sure. Yeah. Yeah, just focus on three through nine on that. If you go and you go past that and you do the other, you're just gonna have to kind of see what I'm doing as I'm doing the homework because I, I haven't given you examples of it. I haven't shown you them. So, but I won't test you on, I'll only test you on things that are coming from like three through nine. All right, I'm not gonna push any further than what we've done here. All right, I wanted to at least start 8.7 today. Because 8.7 is where it all comes down to, okay, you know, if somebody gives you a function, how in the world do you come up with its power series, right? Like, how do you find it? This, we were relying very heavily here on this, right? Everything was based on this. If we couldn't somehow make this look like this, then we are dead, dead in the water, right? So eight, seven. Is titled Taylor and McLaurin series. So this is this is the brilliant, brilliant thing that Newton was able to come up with that Leibniz didn't. All right. So here's the idea. If you're given a function, that can be represented as a power series. So if we assume, okay, we're assuming that we're given some function and that, that there is a power series for it, all right? We're, we're assuming that to start. Then we know that these all look the same, right? Look, all power series look like this, C sub zero plus C sub one times X minus A. Um, plus C sub two and then X minus A squared, plus C sub three and then X minus A to the uh, third. Every power series looks exactly the same. The only thing that's different, the only thing that differentiates power series from one another are the constants. That's it, okay? The constants. Those constants dictate what function you're looking at. Remember I showed you the one for sine and we said it was all odd powers of X. And I showed you cosine was all even powers of X. The thing that was controlling that were these numbers in front, right? Those were the things controlling it. So how can we figure out maybe a way of determining what those numbers are? Like if somebody gives you a function, can you then tell me, if I can tell you what C0, C1, C2, C3 is, if I can tell you what it is, then, <clears throat> then you'll have the power series. So let's try it. Let's try it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that's going to be weird, but I, I want to ask you this first. So we're given a function. Um, you, have to, you have to keep in mind, I'm given a function. So maybe this is like, I don't know, e to the x or... Maybe it's like sine x, or maybe it's cosine x. I don't know. I'm given a function. I'm trying to find its power series. So keep in mind, you have the function, right? You have it. So first thing, what would f, God dang it. what would f of zero be? Or sorry, f of a, I meant to say a. What would f of a be? Well, if you plug a into this power series, what would you get? Right here, plug it into here, what would you get? 
a minus sure. a to some problem or some number. A minus a, zero, a minus a, zero. A minus. Wouldn't you just have that one constant right there? Mm -hmm. Whatever that constant is. Remember, you have the function, okay? You have the function in your hand and you, and you know what a is, all right? So if I plug a in to the function, that's c sub zero. Right, so right now we know what c sub zero is. It's the function's value at a. Now, let's go see if we can't find what c sub one is. So watch this. This is where things get amazing, I think. I would ask you right now to take, derivative of, take the derivative of the function. Okay, I'm gonna box this because we know what c sub zero is. What is the derivative of the function? So I'd like for you to take derivative out here. Okay, so what's the derivative? Derivative that's gone. And then uh, what's the derivative of this? C sub one, isn't it? And then the next one should be two C sub two X minus A to the first power plus three C sub three X minus A squared. I'm gonna do another one, four C sub four X minus A to the third. Are y'all following me? We did this earlier, didn't we? Yeah, we did. I'm just differentiating this plus yeah. dot, dot, dot. Okay. Now, let me, let me ask you to consider this. What's f prime? What's the derivative at a? So what would happen if you plug a into this derivative? This one would be? Zero. 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 They'd all be zero except for what? C sub one. So now I know what? I know what c sub one is. c sub one is the derivative of the function plug, plugging a into it. All right, now this is not maybe obvious yet, but watch, I'm gonna now do the second derivative. What's the second derivative of this function? Okay, so derivative of this is gone, right? Now, what happens here when I take derivative? What am I left with? 2c to the 2. 2c to the 2, right? And then all derivative, that's just 1. Okay, plus, now be real careful here. What happens here when we take derivative? 3c sub 3 is just a constant, right? But this 2 comes out, doesn't it? That 2 comes out. So I know you want to say 6, but don't say 6. I'm going to write 2 times 3c sub 3 x minus a to the first power. <laughs> plus, what would happen on the next one? Three would come out, right? I know you want to say 12, don't say 12. Three times four, C sub four, X minus A to the what? Second, right? Plus, and then there's more, isn't there? Anyone have an idea of what I'm gonna do now? F double prime of A. F double prime of A. Good, so what happens when I plug A into the second derivative? Gone, gone, they're all gone, right? Except for this one, two C sub two. Okay, so this is the first time that I've gotten a number in front of C sub two, so I'm gonna divide both sides by two and I get C sub two. Look at this, everyone. I'm, I'm creating formulas for these constants. C sub zero is just the, the function's value at A. <laughs> C sub one is just the, the value of the derivative, first derivative at A. C sub two is the value of the second derivative at A divided by two. All right, let's go for the third derivative. Third derivative of the function. Okay, so take derivative again, this is gone. What happens here? Two times three C sub three plus, now this one, the two comes out, right? two times three times four C sub four X minus A to the first power because the two came out and then plus more stuff, right? And I could keep doing that. Now, again, plug A in again. The third derivative at A is gonna kill everything off except for this. Everything else goes away. So you're left with two times three C sub three. And if I divide both sides, by 
two times three, I get a formula for C sub three. We have a pattern developing, don't we? We have a pattern developing. Let's do the fourth derivative. Now, when we do derivatives, we get tired of doing the prime. So what we, we do now is we replace it with the number and we put in parentheses. So that means the fourth derivative of the function. <clears throat> Be careful, this is not the same thing. That would mean take the function, raise it to the fourth power. This means take the fourth derivative. Okay, that's notation. Okay, so now what happens? Take the derivative of this. This goes away and we're left with this, right? So two times three times four C sub four plus the next one would have an X minus A in it, wouldn't it? It'd be something in front of X minus A and then something in front of X minus A squared plus da, da, da. And now if I plug A into this, the fourth derivative <laughs> at A, I get two times three times four C sub four. And if I divide both sides by the constant and isolate the C sub four, I get two times three times four equals C sub four. Do you all see the pattern? So maybe we can make a guess now. What would C sub n be then? What's the general formula? What's the general pattern that we have here? It should be the what derivative of the function? The nth derivative. Okay, evaluated at A, right? Divided by what? This is the key. What is two times three times four? What is two times three? What is two? What is, what's under, what's under both of these? This is, this is a one under here, right? And that's a one factor. under there. Right. Would it be n factorial? N factorial, exactly. N factorial, n factorial. And this, everybody, is beautiful. That is a formula that gives you the coefficients that you need to create the power series for any function. Now there's a catch to it. You have to be able to take derivatives, but you have, we have a way of doing it, okay? We have a way of doing it. So I, I have enough time to show you one example. Here we go. Find, oh, that's called the Taylor series, by the way. I'm not, uh, uh, you know what? Let's not even do this. Let's just let's just use what we just learned, okay? Use that to find uh, power series for f of x equals e to the x, which is the easiest one we could possibly ever have. All right. So keep in mind, the formula we have is this. Okay, um, and we're gonna do it, sorry, I didn't put this about x equals zero. I have to tell you where we're gonna center our power series, so. All right, so the way we do this, okay, is we, we have to realize first that A here is zero, all right? A is wherever we're centered, okay? So what I need to do is this, I need to make a table. I'm gonna have the, First of all, what's f of a? Let me do it this way. What's f of x? I'm gonna find all the derivatives first. Okay. Find all the derivatives of the function. So let's just do this. What's the original function? e to the x. Great, what's its derivative? e to the x. e to the x, okay. What's its derivative? e to the x, what's its derivative? e to the x, right? Isn't this awesome? e to the x, just the whole way down, right? So what I'd like to do now is take each of these and figure out what their value is at a. So what is that function at zero? So what is uh, e to the zero, what's that? One, right? 
Now I take the, the first derivative and I plug in zero. And this is also one. And then I take the second derivative at zero and I get one. And isn't, aren't these always gonna be one? Aren't these always gonna be one? So fortunately for us, this answer right here, when I'm looking for C sub n, C sub n is always gonna be the the nth derivative of the function at a, but for us, it's always one, right? Always one, we got so lucky, it's always one. So that's just gonna be one over n factorial. That's the formula for C sub n, which means that the power series for e to the x is this, sum n equals zero to infinity. Now remember, all power series are written some c sub n x minus a to the n, right? That's what all power series look like. But I have a formula for that. C sub n is <coughs> for this one over n factorial. And then we're centered at zero. So this is just gonna be x minus zero to the n. So this is just x to the n. That is the power series for e to the x. That's it. Now, if you don't believe it, Here's a graph of e to the x. And here's the power series. And I'm going to start going and putting more terms in. We're going to watch it wrap itself in. And look at that. It's just, it's becoming e to the x. And that's it. And x to the n over n factorial, which is exactly what we just got here. x to the n over n factorial. Now, this, this works out really, really nice because these things are always one, but it's not that case when you try something else. So what if we tried the same thing for the function sine x? We'll just get this one started. We'll finish it up next time. What if we had sine x? And we wanted to do the, the series about x equals zero again. So first thing I'm gonna do is just start writing out the function and its derivatives. What's the first derivative of this? Cosine, right? Second derivative, negative sine. Third derivative, what, negative cosine? Fourth derivative is, where are we at? Back to sine. And then is it gonna start repeating itself? It's just gonna follow the same pattern, cosine. Next one will be negative sine. Next one will be negative cosine. And then back to sine and just keeps going. Now let's plug in zero to these. What happens when you plug zero in here? What's sine of zero? Zero. What's cosine of zero? One. What's negative sine of zero? I know I'm moving fast. Negative sine of zero is still zero, right? What's negative cosine of zero? Shouldn't that be negative one? And then next one will be zero. And then we should start repeating. One, zero, negative one, zero. Do you all see that? So go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. This is this is a little weird because we don't have a pat we don't have like one 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 right. So what we're going to do here, and you're going to give me one more minute to do this, is we're going we're going to attack this slightly different than we did the last one. <laughs> we're going to say this. We're going to say that sine x can be written as a power series. Okay. Yes, it can be written as a power series. We know that the we know that this right here is going to be that. Uh, so this right, here, all of this together, that's C sub n, okay? But we know we know how to get it now using that very clever thing with derivatives. 
if we do this, it, instead of actually trying to come up with a formula for this, let's just write out the first few terms. So let's let n be zero, okay? If n is zero, if n is zero, then what do we get? If n is zero, aren't we looking at this guy right here? Because that's, that's the zero derivative of the function. That right there would give us that first number. So that would give us a zero over, and now I plug in zero for n factorial, so zero factorial and then x to the zero. That'd be our first term. Plus, now we plug in n equals one. And when n is one, we're now plugging that number in for the top over one factorial. So one over one factorial x to the first power. Now I plug in n is two. So when I'm looking at two, now I'm looking at this answer. So when n is two, I get zero over two factorial x squared. <clears throat> Are y'all following me? Now I plug in three. When I plug in three, I'm here at this one. That goes into the top. So it's going to be plus negative one over three factorial x cubed. And then it's going to keep repeating, right? Now I'm going to have plus, I need to go on a different line here. Plus, who wants to tell me the next one? I'm out of time. What's the next one though? That's the top, right? Zero over four factorial x to the fourth. Okay, and then the next one would be? One over five factorial x to the fifth. And then next one, zero over six factorial x to the sixth. And look, if you start canceling this stuff out, I appreciate y'all hanging out here. If y'all start canceling everything that has zero in it, right? You get x minus one over three factorial x to the third plus one over five factorial x to the fifth. And you can predict what the next one would be, one over seven factorial x to the seventh and so on and so forth. And that is your that is your power series for sine. Okay, we will definitely pick up with this next time. Um, try and do um, like I said, eight six problems three through nine and more if you feel like exploring more. And for eight five, um, yeah, all those find the interval of convergence and radius of convergence. Next class, I'm gonna just do as much as I can, and we'll talk about the final. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Have a good one.